All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the fifth day of August, excuse me, October. Something else just came into my mind. <laughs> October in the year of our Lord, 2023. Um, before I get into this, I have to explain some things. I have misplaced my glasses. And right here, you're going to notice something. So, what's wrong with his eye? Yeah, I actually, I've got a little makeup on it because it's a vivid purple this morning. Uh, yesterday afternoon, I had uh, ran out, ran low on chicken feed. Yes, I have chickens, and uh, God's made all kinds of interesting creatures. And I went to get some chicken feed. I brought it back. I was putting it in the shed, fifty-pound bags chicken feed. I threw it over against the wall of the shed. There's also a stand for a uh, miter saw there, folded up against the wall. That came forward. You ever step on a rake? That's what happened. The bag threw the stand forward and hit me in the eye right here. And I've got a shiner this morning. And I've misplaced my glasses. So to make it even more obvious to everybody, and I know you'll all be wondering, spending your time wondering what's wrong with my eye rather than listening to what I have to say about the gospel. Yeah, there's all these distractions in the world. And I was thinking, I just almost don't want to do it because why? Where, where, where's my glasses? God knows where they are. Uh, and uh, I don't want to be distracted by this. <laughs> the video's backwards compared to a mirror, so... Uh. Anyway, that's how this day is starting out. Let's get to what's really important. And unfortunately, I have to deal with a distraction on this, too. I'm beginning to think that theology is created by the devil to, uh, to cloud the gospel. Uh, all kinds of theology. Everything I mentioned yesterday, I believe, Scriptura Nuda. Yes, I want my Bible unclothed by men's opinion because I want to know what God says, and human opinion does not clarify it. No. Um, you're probably much better just reading the Bible than listening to me. The only thing I might have is the experience of, reading, of, of being a born-again Christian for 47 years and reading the Bible as a believer for that long. Believing God, having been saved by God. So, what I want, what I have to deal with first of all, because I want to talk about the new covenant. And there's theology out there. There's two schools of theology out there that that are a problem. One is a, a theology called a Reformed Covenantal theology, A.K.A. Calvinism, uh, that distorts the Bible significantly in their theological system and grossly disfigures God in the core of their system, which most people don't go near. Uh, the, the eternal decree of all things, exhaustively. In other words, God predetermined everything in the finest detail, in advance, uh, Every sin, every vice, every wickedness is the will of God. Obviously, that's not biblical. There's things that God does not know about the future. From the scripture, we know that. Uh, God brought the animals to, to Adam to see what he would name them. If you believe the testimony of scripture, then you have to accept that. A Calvinist said, well, that's just God's just, us just pretending to not know. God doesn't lie. God doesn't deceive. 
Uh, also, the testing of Abraham. God says, now I know. Put Abraham to the test, and now, then he knew that Abraham feared him. Do you believe the testimony of Scripture, or do you believe the words of theology? Okay, so that's one system that's been around, well, since Augustine, really. Um, but uh, Calvin amplified it. Augustine was trained in pagan philosophy. The philosophy. Whether he was ever truly a Christian or not, God knows. But uh, he brought in all kinds of false ideas. Same kind of, you know, the church has been suffering from this from the beginning. And today it continues. People do what is right in their own minds. Uh, Salvation Army is an example of that. I used to think that uh, William Booth was a great hero of God because he'd taken the gospel into the slums. But, but he, he did, was not restrained by the word of God either. He can't, if he thought something was right, he did it. And we all should know where the Salvation Army is today. Just a, a sexual, essentially a secular social service agency. Most people don't even know. They don't even collect their own offerings, you know, the, the, with the, the bucket at the door in Christmas season. They have non-salvationists out there doing that. You know, you don't find the officers or whatever. Just ugh. Imitation of the world. Obvious imitation of the world. The military structure of the Salvation Army. And, of course, Booth was, like so many bad preachers today, uh, an authoritarian. His way or the highway. That is not the way it is with God. Well, it is God's way, but God also extends grace. If, if some people, you know, turning, turning the grace of God into uh, law, there is no flexibility in law. In the law of Moses, if you remember, uh, somebody would kindle a fire on the Sabbath and they'd stone him to death. Things like that. No, it's... It, there is no grace, there is no mercy in law. Even the law of God. The purpose of the law of God is not mercy and grace. The Calvinists say it's the law is grace. They are crazy. Paul says the law is not grace. It is not grace. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. For the for the through the law comes the knowledge of sin. It just shows you you're a sinner. And to reveal your sin, that's not a work of uh, you know. It, it's, there's no flexibility. You know, you see you as you really are. No. No, it just points you to Christ, says, I can't save you. I just damned you. Go, him, go to him. He can save you. Christ can save you. But another system of theology that is so common uh, in America among uh, evangelicalism, broadly spoken of, including fundamentalism, is dispensationalism. And dispensationalism, although it, it's changing uh, the classical dispensationalism of Darby and Schofield, has some really unbiblical ideas in it. One of the principal ones is that God has two people. He has an earthly people and a heavenly people. And they have separate destinies. It depends. There's so much different stuff in this. There's not, it's not uniform. Different people have different ideas. But that's the general um, teaching of it. Of course, with Schofield, he has multiple gospels and a gap in Genesis, a gap theory to account for billions of years of evolution and all kinds of strangeness in Schofield, who was a Presbyterian minister. He was a Calvinist. So you have Calvinistic dispensationalists. Oh, what a headache that is. Try to figure out that mess. 
Uh, and so theology, I think I've come to the conclusion that scriptura nuda is the way to go. God's word explains God's word. And if you're born again, the Holy Spirit is at work in you. If you're not born again, you're not going to understand the Bible. And that's why people gravitate toward the opinions of man, because they can understand Calvinism because it's not spiritual. It's carnal. It's of the flesh. Well, that actually is Calvinism right there, too, come to think. Where was my hand? No, it's just uh, Grudem, a, a charismatic Calvinist. Yikes. Bad. By the way, I don't absolutely need my glasses. But it, I, I look weird to me looking at the screen here without them. And, of course, this it, it even makes this much more visible. <laughs> Maybe someone doesn't want me to do this video, and it's not good. But, but uh, why this preamble about theology is because these theologies grossly distort the Bible. They pretend to be biblical. They pretend to believe every word, totally inspired by God. But then they twist it with their theology. That you, so if you believe the theology, that will twist your understanding of the scriptures. It's not what God says. Uh, and it's like Calvinism. They'll say, well, obviously, and they'll use the excuse, well, obviously God doesn't have a nose, but he talks about his nostrils. So that's just speaking anthrop uh, um, what is it? in an anthropomorphic manner, a human manner. But then they take things where God is clearly stating something, and if, if it doesn't fit their theology, they convert all that and use the same excuse for all that. They excuse the revelation of the Bible where it contradicts, you know, get rid of it where it contradicts their theology. So their, their theological system is really the authority, and it is in dispensationalism too. Regard, uh, regardless, uh, irregardless of all their protestations about being uh, submissive to God's word and all this, no, they've, they're still seeing the scripture regardless of their intent, through this framework, this interpretive framework that's called dispensationalism. And the, the, one of the, as I mentioned, one of the great errors in that is the idea that God has two peoples, an earthly people and a heavenly people, uh, Christians and uh, the nation of Israel, or the church and the nation of Israel. And... And they often go so far as like that heretic John Hagee as to say the Jews don't need Jesus to be saved. They, they can be saved through the law. That man is utterly ignorant. Plus he's an adulterer. Having committed adultery in the church as a pastor with a young lady that is now his wife. Years ago, but so things like that disqualify you permanently. Permanently. But all these rogues that have been so notorious lately, they keep coming back. John, uh, Mark Driscoll's back now, doing the same stuff he was before. Apparently. At least according to uh, Chris Roseboro, who spends way too much time exposing that stuff. Fortunately, he's also a pastor, so he has a real life other than the Internet. But uh, this is... Uh... So let's go... Uh, so that's why I'm going to Romans chapter 11 here. Again, Paul, these, these, uh, his epistles, they are letters. They are meant to be read through because his thoughts will extend throughout the epistle. And in Romans, especially with Paul, uh, you cannot break him up into verses and chapters. You can't. 
and they put the verses where they don't belong and they put the chapter breaks where they don't belong either. There shouldn't be chapter breaks in a lot of it because there's not a change in thought. Sometimes there, you know, he switches when he goes to from 11 to 12. But 1 through 11, you can't break it up. That's just not the way Paul is. It's like his, his sentences will extend over several verses often. An entire, what we call a paragraph in Paul, is a single sentence. So Romans 11. Hmm. I feel naked with my glasses on. And with my damaged, my, the, the shiner I've got. It was so bad I had to put something on it. Vivid purple. Romans 11. So you, you cannot see, this is, so here, Romans 11 starts here. And you can't understand what Paul's talking about unless you've read, read 10. And if you haven't read 9, you can't read 10. It's, it goes, you can't break this up. And that's why I do not think preaching verse by verse and spending an entire sermon on a single verse as a general practice. I mean, there are verses you could spend a month on, but I wouldn't recommend that either because people will get tired of it. This is supposed to be edifying to the church, not displaying your intellectual proudness. You're supposed to be there to edify the church, to build the church up. And, you know, if you eat one food as your sole diet, it's not good. So you have to, this, these aren't meant to be misused like that. Preaching an entire sermon on one or two verses. We would be doing much better in church if we changed our concept and structure and diminished the pulpit and increased the lectern. More reading of Scripture, less preaching. And I'm one that you know can talk for hours. But this, for, for the benefit of the church, God's word is much more edified, edifying, just being read, than almost all the preaching about it. This is a custom. This is not biblical. We are doing things that are the ideas of men and established by tradition. They are not the word of God. In this case, evangelical or Protestant tradition, uh, the, the glorification of the pulpit. Well, if you're actually just reading God's word and proclaiming the gospel and assisting people to understand it, but if you're spending a whole lot of time sharing your thoughts about and not giving God much airtime, no, that's not the, what you're supposed to be doing in the church. On YouTube, you can do it. Because YouTube is a sewer. It, it's the, uh, what is the river in Rome? The Tiber. All the garbage flows into it. Hopefully they got their water upstream. I say then, again, this you this is just a continuation of ten. It's it's oh these are man made divisions. I say then, is has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. In this case, I'm particularly referring to uh, dispensationalism, 
the idea that God has two separate people. God has not cast away his people who he foreknew. Now I'm going to talk about Calvinism. In Calvinism, this is the eternal decree. Salvation is not by grace through faith in Christ in Calvinism. It's about God's election. That God chose to create some people to be believers and other people to be damned. He created those to be vessels of grace for his glory, and he created those vessels of wrath for his glory also. And your choice has nothing to do with it at all. That's just a mirage, according to Calvinism. No, it's God's choice, and God is, has the only true will in the universe. And, he's, and God can't even change his mind. God is predetermined in Calvinism. God is not alive in, 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 in a proper sense of the word anymore. God does not interact with us. God cannot possibly know us in Calvinism, in their confessions, if you understand their doctrine about the immutability of God, what they're really saying. And what they're saying is not what you think they're saying. He's unchangeable in every way. And I say the incarnation of Christ shows them to be liars and fools. Because they have turned from the truth of God's revelation to their own theology, which comes from paganism, comes from Aristotle and other pagan philosophers. And that goes back not only to Augustine, but definitely Augustine mixed that in there. So did others even earlier. They had some even weirder people like Origen. Uh, he was a character. But the, all these people, all these, these philosophers and teachers in the church, as today, were more popular than the simple preachers of the gospel. It's always been the case, and it is today, too. That's why people flock to, to charlatans and strange characters like John Piper and, and uh, Bill Hables and Rick Warren and James White. and <laughs> just, just, just name the popular ones, and the reason they're popular is because they're not spending much time preaching the gospel. Not really representing God, because carnal men flee from that. They flee from the light. So there's they go to, to a shady ministry. I hadn't pre that, that That just came out right. A shady ministry where you don't have to cover your eyes. So they flock to, to Calvinism because Calvinism is not the biblical gospel. They flock to dispensationalism because it is not the biblical message. They flock to all these things that are of men. For the same reason they flock to cults that are of human beings, not of God. Because of their flesh. It, it pleases their flesh. Romans chapter 1. <laughs> they, they turn aside from God's re revelation to worship all this other garbage and garbage gods. It's like, as I said, the God, and I, most Calvinists don't understand their own confession. What it's saying about God. Most of them don't understand that it's really the same thing Aristotle taught about his hypothetical God. It's impossible to worship because there is no possible communication between that God and humanity or creation. And nothing makes any sense when you understand that. It's just, just oh, it's nonsense. And as the scripture says, the world, through its wisdom, Paul, did not come to know God. 
through his philosophy, they did not come to know God. So obviously, people like Aristotle should be rejected. The Bible says they didn't come to know God. In spite of God's revelation in creation, they turned aside and made up their own, thing, uh, own mind, their own idols in their own head. Although in that case, Aristotle didn't worship that God. He's not capable that God can't be worshipped and cannot respond. It's a dead stone God. Cannot see, cannot speak, cannot hear. That's the God of Aristotle. That's the God at the core of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Because their description of God, the utterly unchangeable in all ways, and the utterly predetermining in all ways, that's also the God of John Piper, by the way. If these people could actually understand their own confession, what it's really saying, I would think most of them would reject it. But back to this. Because it foreknew, uh, uh, God has not cast away his people who they foreknew, he foreknew. The, the word foreknew means previously known. Like Paul was, you know, talk, Paul uses this word about having been known before by people. In other words, he knew you in the past. Yeah, it's foreknown as Israel that he called out of the land of Egypt, the people whom he foreknew. He knew them then. Or do you not know what the scripture says uh, of Elijah when he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left. And they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so, then, at this present time, there remains a there is a remnant according to the election of grace, the choice of grace. When did God choose them? Before the creation of the world? Or then? Uh, when are we chosen? Why are we chosen? Because what does the scripture say? In John chapter 1. But as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become the sons of God. Those who do trust, who come to faith, are the elect. You're chosen because you believe. How often does Scripture have to say that salvation is by grace through faith? Those who believe are saved. How many times did Jesus have to say that? And yet, people can't receive it. Theologians can't receive it. They invent these systems. Why do they turn aside to idols, to the idol of theology, to the, idol, to the God of their own imagination, or the God of Aristotle? Romans chapter 1. It's a fallen man. It's Adam. It's the flesh. So here, God, now, it, it, yes, Paul, God has a people that he preserves for himself. In this world today, even though most people do not believe, God does call people to himself. He, he overrules human flesh. And Paul in 1 Corinthians talks about that calling, and he says, Consider your calling, brother, not many wise according to the world, not many mighty, not many high-born. But God has chosen the foolish things, the things that are of no importance, to shame 
the world, to shame the mighty, to shame the highborn, to shame the wise. God will not allow fallen humanity to glory and to say, I did it. Because that's what the flesh wants to do. And again, this, this is a bit of a side issue here, but it's, it's sort of necessary because of the bad theology that's out there. If you go back and you look at Darby and Schofield, by the way, or Calvin, these are not the kind of people you would want to follow. You would not want these people as pastors in your church. If you would, you'd also love pastors like Mark Driscoll. Because these people, these theologians, these kind of people, don't love the brethren. They lack that a lot. Uh, they are all caught up in their own selves. And uh, they have not been given the love of the Father for God and for the brethren. And that's why so often, and that's what I just talked about in the last video I, I did, that, that those who call themselves Bible believers uh, so often violate the prime directive to love the brethren, to love one another, Christians to love one another for the sake of their traditions, for the sake of their ideas, and make mountains out of molehills and ignore the mountains of God's word. The real important things, just like the Pharisees, that strain out a gnat and swallow the camel, or that tithe the dill and the mint and the cumin of the garden, but neglect the more important commandments of love and faithfulness. So you can do the tithing of the law. The flesh can do that. But when it comes to the love toward God and love toward your your fellow Israelites, which was your neighbors. That is the heart, and God has to change your heart. And that's what the New Covenant is about, and that's what I'm going to try to get to, although this will probably be a multi-part uh, video the way it's going. But it's necessary, unfortunately, to, to uh, because of the widespread doctrines of, of dispensationalism and the, the idea, uh, the false idea that God has multiple separate peoples uh, to deal with the scripture here and show you that it, con it, it contradicts what they say. So Israel and the church is forever separate in dispensationalism, classical dispensationalism. Two different things. What does Paul teach? What does the scripture teach about this? See, see, if you get this wrong, it's going to confuse the New Testament drastically. And where does confusion come from? God is not the author of confusion. We know who's the author of confusion. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, So God, so the response of, uh, of God to Elijah is that, no, they're not all gone. I've reserved 7,000 for myself that have not worshipped Baal. Even so then, at the present time, again, this is, has, has God not, you know, what what's happened to Israel? The whole thing back in chapter, starting with chapter 10 is, if this is true, why don't the Jews believe? Why don't most of the Jews believe? If this is really, you know, the God of Israel who has sent his son into the world, how come most of the Jews have rejected their Messiah? Paul's answering that question.
So he took cast away his people as a whole. The descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The nation. No, here it's like it, it, in the time of Elijah. They didn't all go pagan. God had kept 7,000. A remnant. A remnant according to grace. God had protected them. Kept them away from that. That they're just like at the flood. God didn't destroy all of humanity. The grace of God, the election of grace, the choice of grace, God chose Noah and his family to preserve the human race. And with the ark also uh, many of the animals, a remnant to repopulate. Even so, then, at the present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. In other words, God's choosing, uh, not predetermining, but choosing to save, according to his will, particular individuals, are extending a special grace to make sure that, because the natural tendency of humanity is to reject the gospel. They can receive it. The scripture says so, that the, God did not leave them without witness and, and perhaps that they might stumble across God. It's not totally impossible, but the natural tendency of humanity is so strong and the aversion to God and to, to the revelation of our sinfulness is so strong that, that, God, that you know, we have to be, it has to be God that is at work to bring us even to repentance even to, to see our own sinfulness. We, we avert our eyes from the light. So there's a remnant according to the, the choice of grace, not the choice of works. And as, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, God chooses the foolish things to shame the world. Because they think it's about them. It's how good they are, how great they are, how wise they are. God will choose those people. No, God chooses the opposite. Generally, he'll choose some of them too, just to show he can. That God can save the wise or the powerful or the mighty occasionally, just to prove it's in his ability. Oh, God's so weak, he can only choose the foolish people. No, he, no, he chooses to choose the foolish people. And the, the people, you know, like there's been so many drug addicts and, and people that have fallen so low, so many of them, like the, the demoniac of the gatherings. Jesus went out of his way, went into a pagan area to choose someone who apparently wasn't even a Jewish person to deliver them from Satan. The woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, which is, Samaritans weren't pagans, but uh, he went outside of the normal way the Jews would go to meet her at that well and bring the message through her to the Samaritans who received him. And this, this is the story that, that the pagans have been more open to Christ that God's own people. That's what Paul's dealing with here. Why is that? You know, you, the Old Testament, it's, it's not fun to read. 
because Israel is always rebelling against God. In the flesh, there is not the ability you know, the, to come to the light because we're by conception, by birth, we are self-centered and look to ourselves and don't want another God in our life. We want to be God. That's the flesh. We want our will, not God's will. That's the flesh. So there's a remnant among Israel, just like the 7,000, when Paul's writing this. Paul's one of, part of that remnant. The apostles were part of that remnant. The Jewish believers were the remnant of Israel. But only the Jewish believers are the people of God, of the Jewish nation. Just like in the book of Revelation, there's 144,000 the Jewish remnant. Because God made promises to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But all believers are part of the promises made to Abraham. We are the children of Abraham, as Paul teaches. We are the true children. The children of faith. Not the flesh. Not the flesh of Abraham, but the faith of Abraham. And if by grace it is no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. If you're saved by your deeds, by your obedience, by works of law, or any works, it's not grace. The scandal is God chooses sinners to save, irrespective of their works, obviously. There are no works, good works among the spiritually dead. If you're spiritually dead, you can't do anything acceptable to God. And if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work would no longer be work. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect, the, 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 those, the remnant, those that were chosen by God out of Israel, have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Who blinded them? Well, their own sin blinded them. They were already blind. But they hardened themselves in their own sin. The more you reject the light, the blinder you get. We're not born utterly blind, but the longer, the, the more times we reject God's revelation, the harder we will get. But in spite of that, And I, I have to interject a, a a true story. Personally, this is something I witnessed. I don't use illustrations that I do not know are true. This has happened in my life. When I had the, the Christian bookstore, a man and a woman, an elderly couple, I think in their 80s, came to the bookstore wanting to buy their first Bible. They had lived, as a man testified, they lived a, a life as a sinner, worldly person. And then for some reason, they went to a local Baptist church, one that I wouldn't expect to be particularly good, little country, church in a little tiny country town. And he heard the gospel there, and, and they were saved they were saved, so they were at the bookstore to get their first Bible, 80-some years old. Confessed, said, I've lived a sinful life. So the work of conviction of sin, had been, the Holy Spirit had been working in them, obviously. This is, not, this is, a, this is an exceptional thing. You know, this, usually people are saved when they're younger. And here's a couple that was 80-some years living in the world, living sinful lives, like all the world does, and God saved them. Because all the experts say, oh, you, if you don't get saved when you're in your 20s or earlier, you're probably not going to get saved. <laughs> God loves to prove people wrong. 
They don't know. Because it's it's up to God. It's God God can do it. Why doesn't he save everyone? Because he doesn't do things that way. He's chosen not to do things that way. He has chosen it to be by faith. It's like that, that couple. They believed the gospel. If they had refused the gospel, they wouldn't have been saved. It is by the grace of God through faith. Calvinists eliminate the faith. They eliminate the person having to respond with faith. They take that out of the picture completely. They, they do talk of a, a general call and a special call. And I think to a degree that's true. Uh, that, that God has a general call to all people uh, uh, through creation and through the public preaching of the gospel. Most people don't respond. But I, I do think, and I have to, looking back over my life, that God has chosen to extend grace to people and uh, individuals that he has chosen to. I look back over my life and I, I see moments before I ever came to faith where I had sort of encounters with God. And a whole lot of sin, too. <laughs> a whole lot of sin. But they weren't saving, but I was aware of, of him. There were times when I was aware of God. And times I knew that God had protected me. But then there's other people I've met that, I mean, they're like, completely spiritually dead. It's like stones. So even though I certainly was a, a, a sinner and a rebel and everything else, yet God continued to work in my life and brought me to salvation. After I, after I saw my need, yeah, I realized how bad I was, and who that was by the grace of God. But other people could do the same thing, and they'd be hardened. So it is God whose salvation is of the Lord. But I do not believe God creates people to be damned. I do not believe Calvinism. It goes way too far. That's that's often theology where it goes wrong. Is it takes things that are that are revealed in the Scripture but it goes too far with it and does not. The scripture has other things that counterbalance that so they don't. it doesn't go to the extreme that they take things to. It's humanity. They want to distort the word of God. Uh, so it is by grace, it's no longer by works. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded, those chosen by God. I think God does do a special call on some people. Otherwise, maybe no one would be saved. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to, you know, um, go too far with that. I think I think it's possible for people to be saved without special intervention, but most of us, I think, need special grace from God to be saved because <laughs> we're especially bad. Uh, but that's the people God chooses. See, it's, it's it's not our goodness; it's God's goodness that that's on display here to the angels. That God would save a wretch like me. You know who read, uh, wrote that song? Uh, that that hymn, "Amazing Grace," was a slave trader. At one point, he became a captain of captain of, of a slave ship. A wretch. You know, and, and slavers were murderers. They, they'd, uh, they, they'd throw people overboard. They get sick or something. They toss them overboard. Uh, a, uh, a lot of times, the, the, you know, when slave trade was illegal, they'd see a warship, a British warship or something coming up on the horizon. I think this was after, uh, 
is it John Newton's day, uh, that they would throw the cargo overboard, get rid of the evidence. Just like today, we see drug smugglers toss the drugs off, off the boat. Well, that's what they did then. Toss the cargo. Human beings. But they didn't treat them as human beings. They didn't treat them. Just a commodity. That's why this, that hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. And that's the kind of people God chooses. They, they, they become trophies of his grace. It's not their works, it's his work. The amazing works of God in wretched, wicked people. This is definitely going to be a multi-part video. <laughs> Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see, and ears that should not hear to this very day. Why? Because they had. See, Israel, too, had all this revelation. They had the law. They had the prophets. And yet they hardened their hearts against it. So when you harden your hearts, it's, it's like God is going to, okay, that's the way you want to go. Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God comes upon you for rejecting the light, and he gives you over. You want to go that way? I'll let you. That's like a parent's wrath. When a parent, especially with a rebellious teenager, a rebellious son or daughter, there comes a point, often, well, like the prodigal son, you could almost say this in that case, too, although it's pushing that story maybe a little bit, that's reading into it a little bit more than it's actually revealed in Scripture. But the, the idea that, okay, if you want to go that way, I'm going to let you. Maybe you'll learn a lesson. It's like the final hope, you know. That, okay, you go down there, you'll find out what it really is, the door will be open for you to come back. But sometimes you just have to let them go. You have to let them go and find out which way they're headed by experience. And hopefully they'll last long enough to come to repentance. So that's uh, God is a good father. He doesn't force you He's not enough. He doesn't beat you into submission. He treats us as creatures he made in his own image. And the core of Calvinism just destroys all this, by the way. Thank God that most of them don't understand their own theology. Otherwise, they'd really be wicked. They don't understand it. James White doesn't understand Calvinism. Picking on him because he's, well, look, but look where he is now. Is he preaching the gospel? No, he's out there preaching theonomy, the law of God. That's going to be the savior of the nations, the law of God. Put the, the nations under the law of Moses. That's what theonomy is. Did it help? Did it save Israel? No, it condemns you even more. The law brings wrath. It doesn't bring obedience. See, if you if you use if you if a person is beaten into submission, it doesn't change their heart. They'll obey out of fear of punishment, but they won't obey out of out of love. That's not what God wants. You cannot force people to love you. You can command them to love you, but that doesn't cause them to love you. God has to do a radical work in you, and that's what this video is going to eventually get to, although probably not in this section.
And David says, let their table, again, this is an explanation of why so few Jews were believing in the gospel. Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense, a repayment to them. Let their eyes be darkened and let them not see and bow down their back always. Now, Paul is saying that David is speaking this of his own people. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Israel as a nation, not talking individually here. Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Salvation. Well, so... Uh, has come to the Gentiles. So the nation that is saved is what? Is, is, is God's people are those who belong to God. That's, that's his nation. In the Old Testament, under the law, if you didn't keep the covenant, you were cut off. didn't matter what nation you were of. Not everybody that was in Israel that came out of Egypt was a, a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All those who were willing to follow all those that, that put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, whether it's, uh, Jews or Gentiles, were saved, as far as saved from the judgment. All those, you, you had Rahab the harlot. She's one of the ancestors of Jesus Christ. She was not a literal descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but she was a descendant by faith. Salvation is by faith. Grace through faith. But if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? So God hasn't forgotten them, hasn't forgotten that people, even if they have experienced the curses of the law, which we've seen in the 20th century. Everything that happened to the Jews in the 20th century were right in accordance with the, were, uh, the curses of the law. It says, you do this, this is what's going to happen to you. You disobey, you reject God, you reject the commandments of God, you don't keep the covenant, this is what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to exile you, scatter you out through the world, and they'll hunt you down, and they'll persecute you, and they'll kill you. The very things that happened in the death camps are written in the word, word of God in the law about unfaithful Israel. Just like all the abortion, it's written in the Law and the Prophets. Those who reject God, the children of the wicked, the seed of the wicked, will be cut off. They, when they abort their children, fulfill the very word of God. Did you know that? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I, as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead. See, this is, we find this in the prophets and in the book of Revelation, particularly when Christ returns, then the, the, the Jewish people at that time will recognize him. The blindness will be taken away from them and they will recognize him and recognize that this is the one that we crucified. So they are not utterly cast away. God will fulfill his promises to the fathers. But that, to, for, to a remnant. To a remnant. Just like among the Gentiles. Not all Gentiles are saved, but God is calling people from every nation, tribe, and tongue to be his people. There is not two peoples, there is one people. If the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. Okay? 
The first fruit is the, the grain that you gathered in the field, the wheat, the first of the harvest that was set apart to God. What's the lump? That's the dough. So you take that wheat and you break uh, if the, that holy wheat and that ho then you make it into holy bread. So that's the lump is the dough. The, 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 the uh, first fruits here is the first fruit of the harvest, which was uh, holy to God. It was to be set aside to God. So he's using that as an illustration, just to so you understand the, the language there. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Now here he's getting into the olive tree in, uh, illustration. This is important to understand what the church is. It's not what's called replacement theology, and it's not what's called dispensationalism. God has one people, and I'm going to ask the question right now, who is the root? Who is the root of God's people? That should be a simple question. And if some of the branches were broken off, the unbelieving Jews, even in the Old Testament, those that didn't keep the covenant, the new covenant, which is what this is going to eventually get to, though not in this video, is the, the, the new covenant is what they're broken off from through unbelief. Unbelief. Salvation is by grace through faith. It's always been by grace through faith. It's not by birth. It's not by circumcision. It has never been by keeping the law. David talked about the, 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 the blessed one to whom God does not impute sin. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Count his transgressions. David trusted in God. And because of his faith in God, God didn't impute his sin to him the way it should have been. He should have been put to death along with Bathsheba, Bathsheba for that whole set of transgression there. But God spared his life in contrary to the law. Grace, unmerited favor. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, a wild olive tree, so you have the domesticated olive tree, Israel, the people of Israel, God's people there. Uh, again, they weren't, some of them were Gentiles brought in. And you were grafted, uh, and you being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root. What is the root and the, uh, and the branch of, of Israel? The root is Christ. Christ. He is the seed, singular, of Abraham. Blessed, blessed your seed, your seed. It's a singular. The seed of Abraham is Christ, and in Christ shall all nations be blessed. You need to know that. It's a singular, not plural. It doesn't say the seeds of Abraham, his descendants, plural, but the single descendant, Christ. It's all tied up in Christ, who is God, who is the Savior. You became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. The oil. That's the fatness. The oil. Olive oil. What's olive oil a symbol of? In the Bible. What's an, what are what's uh, anointing oils? Olive oil. What What's the symbol of? The Holy Spirit. Partaker of the Holy Spirit. <sighs> we'll get into that later in succeeding videos here. Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Now, again, it's not just simply the Israel of God. The Israel of God, the root is Christ. He is the root. He is the fatness. He is the life. 
without him, there is no olive tree. Cut the cut off from the root, there's the tree dies. Right? He is the root. You will say then the branches are broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. Not because of the will of God, because of unbelief, Calvinists. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness. So so much so for the, uh, the shoddy, once saved, always saved doctrine. How many warnings are there in Scripture that say you must continue in faith? You must continue to abide in Christ in, by faith. Reject him, deny him, and he'll deny you. See, many ignore those uh, scriptures, simply don't talk about them, cast them over their shoulder because of their doctrine. Not because of the Bible, because of their system of doctrine. And these are almost always dispensationalists. Why? I don't know. What, what is there in dispensationalism that would cause them to do that? It's man's reasoning. It's, uh, but typically this, they are dispensationalists. Uh, Calvinism, for example, has a, something similar, the perseverance of the saints, but it is because of God's grace and choice that they persevere, not because of their, uh, their goodness. But that, for Calvinists, faith is a byproduct, not a source. It's not, faith is not a means of salvation. It's solely a result of salvation, which isn't biblical either. Partially true, partially true. Uh, when you get saved, God gives you a, a different kind of faith that's much better than natural faith. But yes, you have to believe the message. You have to believe the gospel. You have to hear it and believe it. You have a part in your salvation in that, in receiving Christ and believing the message. That is not something that is predetermined by God. Because the scripture repeatedly says it's by grace through faith. It doesn't say it's by grace and then stops. It says through faith in Christ. And they also, so if, otherwise you will be cut off. You don't continue in Christ, you will be cut off. It doesn't mean perfect obedience. It, just, it means basically, it doesn't mean that, that if you grow cold, you're cut off. It means if you deny him, he will deny you, because that's explicitly taught by Christ himself and the apostles. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, they're cut off as long as they're not believing in Christ. Unbelieving Jews are outside of God's people. They're not in a separate people. They're outside. They are cut off from Israel. Gentiles are grafted into the Israel of God. The unbelievers are cut off. Believing Gentiles are grafted in. Believing Jews are grafted in. Unbelievers are cut off. They're outside the tree, the tree of life, you could say. Because the only, life is only in that tree, in the tree that it, whose root is Christ. All the, all the, the nutrients and the, the water and everything else comes from the root If they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off of the olive of the olive tree, for for if you were cut off of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, paganism, 
You're cut off, separated from that, separated from unbelief, and you were grafted in contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree. Now, this, this is a very common agricultural metaphor. You, gra you can graft a branch from one tree into another tree that's not its own. Fruit trees is commonly done with. You could have varieties of apples grafted into a fruit tree. They weren't naturally part of the fruit tree, but you can graft them in, and they will grow and, and become part of that tree, even if they are different. That's his m metaphor here. Most people know nothing of this nowadays. In Jesus' day, this would be common everywhere. How much more will these, who are natural branches, actually were part of the tree, be grafted into their own olive tree? So Gentiles, those who are not according to the flesh of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but are believers in Christ, we are grafted into Israel, the Israel of God, the only Israel that there is. That entity in the Middle East that calls itself Israel is not Israel. Not the true Israel. Not the Israel that trusts in God. Most Jews are, are unbelievers anyway. And the ones that are believers are believers not in the God of the Bible, but in their own, in the Talmud. The God of the Talmud is not the God of Scripture. They're, they're blinded. They are blinded. Spiritually blinded because they don't have faith in Christ. They don't believe in their Messiah. They've rejected him and continue to reject him. And Israel, uh, Christians that go to, to rabbis, thinking they're going to get wisdom of God from them, these are people that are cut off from God and are spiritually blind. There is no wisdom to be found there. I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, and the blind, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, in the book of Revelation, we find at the end, and so all Israel shall be saved. Who is all Israel? Well, Paul's explaining it right here. Gentile believers are grafted into the Israel of God, the nation of God. We are all descendants of Abraham through faith, as Paul clearly teaches in this. I think it's in Romans. Or it could be in Galatians. Because Galatians talks a lot about this too, and the relationship of the law. So will all Israel be saved, as it's written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. See, God will grant them repentance. The scripture talks about God granting repentance to people. Repentance is not turning away from sin. It's turning away from yourself. It's turning from sin to God, from loving that. It's a change of mind, a change of attitude. The people that say you must put away your sins and, and in order to be saved. No, get saved and then God will put away your sins. God will change your heart. We'll get to that patient time. It's just I can't do this in five minutes because it's... Look at how long it takes Paul. I'm delivering what Paul is teaching here, so... So part of this, this mystery of God, too, is, is because Jesus didn't come just to save the Jews. 
See, they didn't understand that. The church, in fact, didn't understand that initially. That whole thing with, with Peter going to the house of Cornelius. When we have the first Gentiles. Now, there, was, um, there were Samaritans that were brought in before that. But they weren't really outside of the people of God. They were not on believers in Yahweh. And they were looking for a Messiah. As the testimony of the woman of the well tells us. We've heard that a Messiah is coming. And Jesus says, I'm he. I'm here. The one who gives living water. So the all Israel that will be saved here is what? The Jews and Gentiles who believe. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away on godliness, but this is particularly of Israel. He'll, he will grant them a spirit of repentance, it said in the prophets. And they will, he will open their blind eyes when he returns. And they will believe. He will remove this partial hardening. God has not forgotten them. They are wayward sons and daughters prodigals at this current time. And they're not taking the hints. Even the Holocaust, rather than causing them to turn back to God, realizing that these were judgments that were written in the law, many of them turned to godlessness. How could God permit this? Why didn't you read your own law? Judgment on unbelieving Israel. Why do you listen to the Talmud rather than your scriptures? And he, the deliverer will come from Zion. And he will turn away on godliness from Jacob. Jacob is ungodly. Unbelieving Jews are ungodly. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, the promises to the father, fathers and uh, th that God would do these things, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Not because of their own, for their own sake, but because God is faithful to his promises. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Talking about the promises to the nations, to the nation of Israel, to his people. God will not cancel them. He cannot break his word. God cannot lie. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. Because they, because they rejected the Messiah, the gospel went to the Gentiles. As part of God's plan. Even so, these also have now uh, been disobedient, that through the mercy uh, shown you, they may obtain mercy. So, so it's like today, who, where, where do the Jews get the gospel from? From the Gentiles now. This is a, in, the, in the wisdom of God. So the pagans are now instructing the Jews in the gospel. Hmm. For God has committed all to disobedience, both Jews and Gentiles. It's all the same. Everybody comes through Christ. Everybody's a sinner. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. And now the free gift of salvation is in Christ, the root of the olive tree. He's committed all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all, both Jew and Gentile. You're all in the same boat. Literally, you're all, you're all in the ark if you trust in him. In Christ. Well, come to think of it, Noah was a Gentile. Wasn't he? 
So is Abraham. Oh, the depths of wisdom and the mercy of God. Uh, I think that's the epistle to, what is it, Ephesians? No, I don't know. So everybody's in the same boat. All have sinned, all fallen short of the glory of God. And God has opened up the doors of salvation to all. Through faith in Christ. Who are the elect? Those who believe. <laughs> oh, the depths of the... I, oh, so often I get ahead of myself here. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Past plumbing, like the... Unsearchable. How can you... God is so far beyond our comprehension. So much greater than our comprehension. Not that we can't comprehend him at all, but we just he just goes, when you start pondering on God, it's like, I just can't make, it's, it's, oh, I'm so weak. I'm so incapable of, of fathoming him, plumbing the depths of God. It's, oh, we definitely need a, a, a new body. When he comes, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has become his counselor? Or who, who has first given to him that it should be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom glory be forever. Amen and amen. All right, so I'm going to end this uh, this section now. This series here is on the new covenant, what Christ purchased on the cross for us. And this is essential knowledge for Christians. And theology has stolen this knowledge from the church. The Reformed have a bit of it, but it has been covered over by their own theology and their own man-made covenants. The, uh, and they muddled everything together. Uh, Catholics, they're in a whole different boat. Although I have heard this text that we'll deal with being proclaimed as part of the liturgy in a Catholic basilica. So it's, they're not without witness. It's just their trust is not in God's word. It is basically in the church, what calls itself the church. So that they don't believe the gospel. It's personal faith in Christ, not in any institution, not in the system of theology. It's in faith in Christ himself, trust in Christ, in the person of Christ and his works. And now at, at the end of chapter 11, he goes into chapter 12, which is address, addressing more or less practical issues within the church. So here, this is the end. This 11 ends the whole section that starts at chapter 1 in the book of Romans, which is the most important, one of the most important books in the New Testament, if not the most important, uh, because it explains the gospel. It presents the gospel the gospel of salvation by grace through faith in Christ and that alone. Galatians is, is like a small book of Romans uh, dealing with that problem. But Paul here is really sharing with the church in Rome, which he didn't start. Uh, apparently the apostles didn't start it. It was started by Christians. That A lot of things went back and forth to the capital of the empire. And so Paul wants to share this knowledge, this revelation that he has, he has of God, who is, he, is, he was chosen to be the, the theologian of the gospel, so to speak, in a much better way than, than modern theologians or ancient theologians. He is, if you want to understand the gospel, you go to 
the book of Romans. Uh, because this is where it is really laid out. And many things are laid out here. Uh, Hebrews is, uh, when it comes to explicit teaching about the new covenant, using that language, you go to the book of Hebrews. Because he's the writer, the, the unknown writer of the book of Hebrews. Some have speculated Apollos. I've even heard it, some people speculate Luke, but I'm not quite sure what basis they have that uh, for that. The, 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 the writer doesn't identify himself. So the church was a little bit slow as far as recognizing Hebrews as canon inspired because of that, because uh, they're one of the criteria for uh, canonicity, uh, holy scripture, was that it was written by an apostle. So the ones that weren't of clear apostolic origin were, they had to be, were recognized less slowly, and they're recognized because of the spiritual content that's in them. They weren't, you know, there is no revelation in Scripture of the canon. <laughs> It, uh, by, by the second and third century, it was pretty well established. It's, it's fairly obvious to, to Bible-believing Christians. It's like you go back and read the non-canonical old light writings that were included uh, in the Greek Old Testament that weren't part of the... The Jews didn't recognize them as inspired. Uh, I don't know why they included them in some things. They're not scripture. It's any born again believer should read them and recognize that. But all right, so I'm going to uh, end here at an hour and a half. So some people, I suppose, can just skip this first video and go on to the second one, which will will look at the uh, the new covenant itself, the promises of it in the Old Testament, and. Uh, again, this I thought this was necessary because of bad theology, and particularly the bad theology, in particular the bad theology of dispensationalism with their two separate peoples of God that remain forever separate. See, apparently the church in that just stays in heaven forever. I don't know. That's not, they're not, the all these things demonstrate that they're human because they do not, correspond uh, accurately with what the scripture teaches. They come from flesh. They come from from not unbelievers, but people that aren't, uh, that don't think the Bible is sufficient. They don't believe in the sufficiency of scripture. They don't hold to the faith delivered once for all unto the saints as being enough. They want to add to it. They want to add their own opinions. They want people to believe them. We still see that going on today, right? It's always been true. From the New Testament times, in the Old Testament too. False teachers, false prophets. False as in not representing God. So, I'm going to end this now. Stay tuned for the real message coming up shortly.